Right, we are here again, and this time we are on In Conservation With to discuss the birds sitting on my right hand shoulder as you look, um, and that is the Eurasian Curly. And with me tonight is Mary Colwell, who's kind of made it her mission to to effectively save the Curlew. Um, once again, this is In Conservation With. I'm David Lindo also known as the Urban Birder, and this whole evening is sponsored by Leica Sport Optics, so thank you very much for that. Mary, thank you for agreeing to be with us tonight. Um, how are you and where are you? Uh, it's very nice to be here, David, thank you. Um, I'm in Bristol, I'm in, you know, in the West Country. Uh, right in the city centre. Some people think, um, have written to me and said, oh, it must be so nice. You must live surrounded by curlews. You're joking. I live above the bus station in Bristol, but I can still hear them in my head. <laughs> now, it's interesting you talk, you know, we talk about curlews because whenever you read about the Eurasian curlew, especially in British or English or certainly British literature, also arranging back into the past as well, you hear about oh the evocative call of the curlew and I, I as a kid used to walk the hill and dale and I see and hear them, and myself I mean I've been birding all my life and I have no such recollections of curlew. I lived I was raised and born and bred and formative years and all that sort of stuff in London, and I remember seeing my first curlew curlews when I went on my first ever ever youth hosteling holiday when I was. 13 years old and I remember getting getting to um I can't remember it must have been in the Cairngorms or around that way up in Scotland and hearing this call and I knew what it was because you know it's one of those famous calls and plus as a kid and I'm showing my age here um I used to um collect these magazines and there was often these kind of floppy discs kind of records with bird calls on them and uh one of them was had a curly on it and it was it was very evocative, I must admit. I was like, wow, curly. And then I saw it and I thought, wow, it's big. It's the size of a girl. It's huge. Um, but later in life, um, my main sort of time of seeing curlies was birding along the, the shorelines of East Anglia or in Kent. Um, and latterly seeing them even in London. I mean, on my local patch, my West London local patch, Wormwood Scrubs. Um, I've seen Curlew not only standing on the football pitches, but I've seen them flying over, no doubt heading to the London uh, Wetland Centre. But what I need to know from you is why the Curlew? Why, what, what is it about the Curlew that's captivated you? You know, it's such a difficult question to answer, isn't it? I mean, why is anything, anybody's sort of, does it touch a sort of particular, ignite a spark? I think I just love the way they look. I absolutely love it. I love their long bill. I love their all that sort of sculptural form they have. Um, they're all sort of round. They're a bit curly, aren't they? And uh, they're curly curlews. And they have this heavenly core, which just ignites your soul. It's just beautiful. Uh, it's the way they they it just it just fills the landscape. Their core and. Um, uh, it's uh, it's an evocative call because it kind of mixes the major and minor keys together, and uh, and so we don't quite know whether it's a sad or a, or a happy sound. It does both, so it really sort of fires your emotions. And I think being British, we all we all like the um, we all like the understated, don't we? I mean, it's not a parrot, is it? It's not an eagle. It's got a brown and stretchy neck and long legs and things. But you know, we, we like the underdog. So uh, for all those reasons. I just, I just love them. I can't explain why they just do it for me. Okay. Well, for those who don't know who Mary is, I mean, I actually not met you, Mary. I think we've exchanged glances uh, across crowded disco floors, but never really kind of connected eyes. So we, in your we dreams, David. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just to kind of break down who you are, um, Mary's an author, producer, and campaigner for Nature. Um, her articles have appeared in the Guardian newspaper, BBC Wildlife magazine, uh, the tablet, what's the tablet? Oh, it's a, it's a, actually it's a Catholic uh, periodical, a sort of current affairs -y religious thing. Okay, yeah. Country Life and many other publications. You've made documentaries for the BBC Natural History Unit, um, uh, both on the TV and radio. 
You published three books, um, John Muir, The Scotsman Who Saved America's Wild Places, and that was in 2014. Curlew Moon, which is obviously applicable for tonight, which was um, published in April 2018. And Beak, Tooth and Claw, which is your new book coming out in April, which uh, sounds exciting. You have to give us a quick breakdown on that. Um, in 2009, you won uh, a Sony Radio Academy Gold Award. Sounds good. Uh, and in October 2017, you were awarded the Dillis Breeze Medal by the British Trust for Ornithology for Outstanding Science Communication. Fantastic, because that's a coveted award. Um, you also got the David Bellamy Award in 2018 from the Gamekeepers Association for your conservation work on curlews. And in 2019, even, the uh, Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust Marsh Award for Conservation. Um, in March... Uh, this year, you were appointed chair of the government-supported Curly Recovery Partnership England, uh, a roundtable of organisations charged with restoring curlews, their habitats and associated wildlife across England. And in 2020, last year, you set up the charity Curly Action. And you are also spearheading the establishment of a GCSE, and for those who are not familiar with a GCSE, it's, a, it's an exam level in secondary school on or in natural history. And that separate subject is going to be the separate subject for another night with Mary. Um, and that will be on April the 1st, I think. You're coming back, aren't you? So, guys, come back. Don't go. Come back again. But anyway, let's talk about Curtis tonight. Before we actually start talking about curlies, actually, let's go back in your history. Who are you and where are, where do you come from? I mean, how do you get into wildlife? What's, what's, your, what's your start? I don't know, David, I just wish I could say I was one of those people that grubbed around and was fascinated by wildlife from when I could crawl. But I, to be honest, I wasn't. It was something that I developed slowly. I sort of got more and more interested as I got older. My first love actually was geology. I absolutely love geology and rocks and fossils and things. I grew up um, mainly in I, in the centre of Stoke-on-Trent and then we moved to the outskirts on the edge of the Peak District. And I think that's where curlews really, I, I have these memories of their calls. They're still there. And I think they kind of just absorb themselves into me. They're also the emblem of the Staffordshire Moorlands. They got all, all the rubbish bins, everybody's household rubbish bins. So <laughs> I saw them every day. Um, but they just, so I grew up in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, I've uh, got two sisters, I think one of both of whom might be here tonight. And um, yeah, and I then went off to university, faffed around, lived in Australia, then came back and now live in Bristol where I had my family. Well, that's fantastic. And you also did a long walk in Spain once, didn't you? I did actually, once, a few months ago. I did the Camino. I did, uh, I've done a few big long walks actually. I did the John Muir Trail, which is the, about 240 miles through the Sierra Nevada in the uh, solo trek through the mountains of California. And then just last autumn, I walked the Camino, which is the 500 miles across the north of Spain, uh, pilgrimage route. And then before that, I did the 500 mile walks for Curlew, so which we'll be talking about in a bit. That's right. I remember you doing that, actually. Yeah. So, OK, but when, what, OK, you heard Curlews when you moved, but when did you actually suddenly realise that you needed to be there guardian angel i think it's because working in the bbc um in those days um blimey it wasn't that long ago either um we got faxes and so on uh, came into the office and they were increasingly from birdwatch ireland saying please help you know curlews in a terrible terrible mess in ireland um and we did a couple of radio pieces on them and i kept an eye on it but uh you know to be honest in the natural history unit in the bbc they don't have teeth and claws or big you know, they don't sort of eat antelopes. So it's quite hard to get programs on things like British birds. Um, but I, I always kept an eye on what was going on. And then by 20, the end of 2015, December 2015, the British birds paper came out, which called the curlew the biggest priority for UK conservation for birds. It was red listed and suddenly it was all looking terribly serious. Um, and that's when I decided I had to do something. I came to the end of a big contract and um, I sat down and put a line across a map and decided to try and find out what on earth was happening to these birds. 
and in 2016, by that spring, next spring, I was off on my trek. It's a real shame that um, the media outlets, I mean, BBC namely, um, do not, when I say media outlets, I'm talking about the people who put out programming on natural history. They have a lot of power and a lot of influence, yet they choose in the main to sort of indulge in jaws, claws and fangs, as you said earlier, and to ignore the things that aren't sexy in their eyes, um, which I think is such a sad thing because it is part of the reason why a lot of kids are growing up not interested because what have we got in this country? What have we got? You know, it's just, it's just because it doesn't kill you or it's not dangerous. It's not of yeah. interest. Yeah, I, I, I know. It's difficult at one, isn't it? I mean, there's undoubtedly the big sexy, the big megafauna get get people watching. Um, I, I, sorry, I think spring, autumn watch, winter watch will say they cover quite a lot of British natural history. Um, well, that's what they do. They cover British natural history. But I, I do <clears throat> agree with you that we don't have enough documentaries about British wildlife. I agree. We did some. I did British Isles and Natural History with Alan Titchmarsh a few years ago. Um, but we, I mean, I love it, so I could watch it endlessly. But you can always write, everybody, write in, demand British natural history. They do, the, the BBC does listen, I promise, if you write. Well, I hope that's true. Yeah, but they do. I think, you know, I think other species certainly do need highlighting, and there's lots of, lots of species out there. I mean, in my work, talking to people about urban birds, I, I spoke to someone today in Madrid who just said, there's no, there's, there's nothing here. There's no birds. I said, of course there is. But people don't realise because there's nothing out there telling them that, you know, there's stuff to be seen. Anyway, um, on to the curlews themselves. So, yeah, what is a curlew? I mean, can you kind of, for those uninitiated in the kind of, I mean, I know I've got one on my shoulder, but... What, what, what constitutes a curlew? Well, it's our largest wading bird, um, and it's a specialist, but, you know, the answer's in the bill. It loves to dig, when it's an adult, to stick its bill into soft sediments and muds uh, and under rocks and so on. So it, it has a very sensitive tip to its bill as well, so it, it gets all those worms and crustaceans uh, deep down underground. Um, and so it, it spends the winter my talk coming up david we're doing it ahead of time so it spends the winter on the coasts and then it comes inland to breed but it's um it is uh increasingly rare and um and it's one which is a great shame because it's it is an icon of so many landscapes um it's actually quite annoying as well because it won't it, it really doesn't like nesting in nature reserves which means which we can talk about in a bit it's largely completely unprotected Okay. Well, why don't we stop? Let's go look at your talk and then we can sort of then chat afterwards because then I won't tread in any things that you may have already talked about. Zoomers, whilst uh, whilst Mary's lining it all up, if you want to watch this in full glory, then uh, if you are watching on Gallery View, switch to Speaker View and you will see the whole of the talk and not a motley crew of lovely faces. <laughs> Okay, shall I begin, David? Let's begin. Oh, how do you... Okay, so there we are. You could see it on David's shoulder, but that's a bit of a better view. Um, the Eurasian curlew, uh, about the size of a duck, I suppose, with long legs and that absolutely glorious bill. And, uh, and you can tell, as I said, it sticks its bill into the grass and into sediments and gets it all muddy. But I mean, who wouldn't love that? Who, who I, I, honestly, I, I would defy anybody to say they don't love the look of that beautiful bird. It's only grey and brown, um, and and cream coloured, but the the patterning is exquisite. It really is. Um, and it's named is Numenius arquata. Numenius means new moon. Arquata means the the tight the the curve of an archer's bow. So Numenius Arquata, even the, the Latin name, refers to its bill. And that bill has inspired people. It still does. It, it's a very evocative and beautiful shape. And, um, and so uh, it's called the new moon bird, or certainly that's what I call it, shape of the new moon. And let's just listen to, um, to it. And I want you to just sort of either close your eyes or just go into that space 
and let the nat natural sound take you to wherever this takes you, because this is what's so special, I think, about the curlew. I think we may have an issue because we can't hear. I oh, know. can't you hear the call? Yeah, because I think, because there's a little trick that Maya taught us, which is that when you actually sort of share the screen, there's a button you press that says allow the screen, the noise to be heard. Uh, it's a shame. Oh, oh well. Anyway, it's, I can't even begin to do, um, uh, the, uh, and then, you know, I can't repeat hey, it myself. Well, can I'll you tell do you what, it, David? <laughs> <laughs> what I can do is uh, maybe at the end of the talk, we can just go back yeah. um, and share the screen again and do the sound thing and you can hear it. Okay. Okay. Anyway. It's or you can, uh, as Dennis has suggested, you can stop the share um, again, restart the share, or this no, is lovely. This we is a great thing it. about live, live webinars. Isn't it? That's all <laughs> right. Fantastic. No, we'll do it at the end. That's fine. We'll do okay, it at the end. Good. Um, and so that sound um, really has inspired some of our greatest poets. And, and even just in Wales, for example, uh, three of the greatest poets and writers that we've had. You know, Dylan Thomas described the call as through throats where many rivers meet, the curlews cry. That, uh, that idea of throats and, and that bubbling sound that comes out. And R.S. Thomas, who was always known for, to be a bit of a laugh, the grey curlew cries uttering a grief too sharp for the breasts assuaging. And uh, Vernon Watkins, very close friend of Dylan Thomas, and when Dylan Thomas died, he knew how much Dylan Thomas loved curlews and he called it a sweet-throated cry by one no longer heard, who more than many loved the wandering bird. So very beautiful and, and inspired really beautiful poetry. Uh, W.S. Graham called it a curlew's love weep. Ted Hughes, a wobbling water call. Thomas Kinsella, a curlew's lingering threadbare cry. W.B. Yeats wrote a whole poem, O curlew cry no more to the air or only to the waters in the west. And A.S. Bullen, who's a poet in South, Southern Wales, such trifling themes as life and death are kept in a curlew's cause. So the curlew, an inspiration to poets and artists and to scientists. But a uh, little bit of science. So this is their range right from the west of Ireland through to uh, right over to the east of Russia. That's their range. And in the autumn and winter, we get a huge proportion of the Northern European birds and they come and spend the winter in the West. Some go down to France and to, to Spain, but 150,000 we get European curlews coming to us for our wet, mushy coastlines in the winter. So that is the most, the time when you're most likely to see them in any number. And, and that's a bit of a double-edged sword because people think there's no problem because there's lots in the winter, but most of those birds are European birds. Uh, but numbers are actually, even though there's quite a few, um, it's absolutely no guarantee of safety because the Eskimo curlew in North America was once the most common water bird in North America. The skies would go black as they flew, their great migrations from Alaska down to the southern part of South America. But two million were shot um, a year as they migrated. Also their feeding grounds were taken up for development and so on. And the very last Eskimo curlew was uh, photographed in um, 1962. And there were sightings in 1963. There's been an unconfirmed sighting since then, but as I say, it's unconfirmed. But as far as we know, the once ubiquitous Eskimo curlew, um, the doe bird, I think it was called, because it was nice and fat when it was shot uh, on migration, is no more. They go so quickly. But that's how we normally see them, that sort of grey brown bird uh, with a bit of cream on it on a grey brown beach next to grey brown water. And that's where you're most likely to see them. That's the wash. Um, thousands go there in, in, in the winter. But come the spring, they go inland. Most go to the northern uplands um, and they uh, nest on the ground in the northern uplands. But quite a few. Yeah. But sometime around the end of the, the 19th, early 20th century, something happened in the uplands. They were an upland bird completely up until the sort of middle to end of the 19th century. 
something happened and numbers expanded and they moved downhill. Probably the introduction of gamekeeping, um, widespread shooting in the uplands, took away a lot of the predators, changed the habitat, suited curlews very well. And the excess birds took from the uplands and flew down. And we didn't have breeding records. Um, they came south and east in a wave. There were no breeding records of curlews in the east of the country, Norfolk and so on, until about 1942, it's quite late. Um, but as soon as they came down, we, we loved them and adopted them into our farms and they became a farmland bird very quickly. And they found all this lovely rich meadows, lots of insect rich hay meadows, and uh, we got used to them being part of our lives. Come the Second World War, as we all know the story, everything shifted, the goalposts shifted. The old fashioned farming, where everything was a bit more slower paced with tractors and uh, hay cutting, not until the summer, has been replaced in large areas by more agribusinesses, I would say, than uh, the old fashioned farming. And that spelled disaster for the curlew, absolute disaster. Alongside the change in farming and the whole shift in the way we deal with cities and rubbish and all sorts of activities means we've had a massive increase in generalist predators right across the UK. Uh, we have the densest population of crows and foxes in Europe, but we have a lot of generalist predators. They do very well in our food rich landscapes uh, because they can eat a wide variety of food, a lot of agricultural food, rubbish from cities and so on, rubbish bins, things like that. Uh, so the curlew was up against it. it uh, so its habitat had been changed by farming, uh, lots of predators, and also recorded on nest cameras sheep. Sheep eat curlew eggs, <laughs> believe it. And actually footage of them, of a sheep pushing curlews off the nest and eating the eggs, which is amazing, really, who knew? Um, and so on one study in Shropshire, we, uh, the, the people who put the nest cameras out over two years uh, looked at sort of 20 to 25 nests each year for two years and found that over half were predated by foxes, um, some were taken by badgers and crows, and um, there, were, there were also quite a few of the chicks were, uh, this is nest failure egg stage, if they did produce um, chicks, they were often mown over by agricultural machinery and silage taking. Another big threat that changed in the post the Second World War was the increase in forestry in the uplands, which took away a lot of the breeding grounds and also is home for things like foxes and crows. So the UK has lost nearly half of its breeding curlews in 20 years. This is BTO data, which means about 119,000 birds have gone, five and a half thousand birds a year, uh, making it the most pressing bird of conservation priority in the UK as of 2015, and it is now red listed. And you can see the grey there, the losses across Britain. Look at, look at Ireland, look at Wales, look at parts of the uplands. Massive, massive declines. So the Breeding Bird Survey showed this precipitous decline of curlews. And they've kind of gone from under our noses, really. They're just slipping away. One example I'll show you in 1994, this is Braden Forest in North Wiltshire. There were 19 pairs of curlews in the small part of North Wiltshire. Today, there are probably five. And I think that is very much a demonstration. Probably five, can't confirm even breeding in those five. So that's a, a prime example of what happens. We had a meeting, um, I noticed a couple of names actually from the meeting last night, nice to see you again. Um, North Shropshire uh, reported in last year, monitoring about a hundred nests and only one of those nests fledged to chick. Uh, Dartmoor only has one pair left of breeding curlews. Worcestershire, they say they're lucky if they've got five. Seven and Avon Vales doing better, 25 nests. Uh, one year, I think a couple of years ago, there were eight chicks, but there was absolutely no productivity at all the year below that. <clears throat> and on average, we think we probably, in England, got around 30,000 pairs left. And most of those will be in the northern uplands. Massive declines. So that's what it looks like. 
Southern Ireland in the 1980s had about 5,000 breeding pairs of curlews. The last count is 135. So we've gone from 5,000 breeding pairs to 135 in Northern Ireland. Southern Ireland, maybe around 200 breeding pairs, 250 at most. Wales has gone a massive decline. And uh, talking to the Welsh people not long ago, they think that the curlew will be extinct as a breeding bird in Wales in 10 years time. Just let that sink in. Extinct as a breeding bird in Wales in 10 years. And Southern England, which is where I have do most of my stuff, um, that's the decline there. So it's all looking gruesome. So in 2016, I set off to try to find out what was happening to the curlew. I set off to start my walk on the 21st of April, which is the average day that the curlews lay their first egg. Obviously varies a bit, but 21st of April is, is what it's thought to be. It's also the feast day of this marvelous little chap in a boat here, who's called St. Baino. And St. Baino um, is a sixth century abbot. And the legend has it that he was sailing off the coast of Wales and he dropped his sermon book of prayers into the sea and a curlew came from the shore and picked it up and took it to the shore to dry. And Baino was so glad he blessed the curlew and said, may you be forever protected. And I thought, well, isn't that great? Wales has got the patron saint of curlews and the, his feast day is the 21st of April as well. Isn't that extraordinary coincidence? So that was a good day to start. Walked right across Ireland, Wales and England, uh, trying to find out what had happened, talking to anybody that would talk to me, artists, poets, scientists, conservationists. Um, went through all the sort of habitats and places you could imagine. Um, ended up on the East Coast about six weeks later. In Ireland, in Ireland, it's just a horror story, really. Lots of the peat bogs where they nested have gone. 99% of the raised bogs of central Ireland have gone, mostly into power stations or converted to agriculture. Um, massive issue with, de with afforestation in central Ireland as well. Sitka spruce, spruce plantations everywhere. But everywhere, the same story. Silage cutting for as many, some places starting at the end of April, beginning of May, four times a year maybe. Uh, lots of afforestation, lots of drainage, lots of intensive agriculture, and um, absolutely no room for curlews left at all. So off the back of that walk, I organized four national conferences. The one uh, top left is in Ireland, top right Scotland, bottom left England, bottom right Wales. I also established World Curlew Day, which is coming up on April the 21st. Put that in your diary and do something marvellous for curlews, wear a big curlew hat or something, and tell the world about the fate of the Eurasian curlew. And I'll be just mention that again in a bit. Uh, World Curlew Day, and that logo was designed by one of my lovely cousins, Nicola, up in Donegal. Isn't that lovely? Uh, we also held a summit in 10 Downing Street uh, with major people from major conservation organisations, politicians and conservationists. And Prince Charles, who knew? Prince Charles loves curlews. He thinks they're, quote, damnably sexy, as he put it, which is great. So he held one conference in, uh, in a hotel in Dartmoor and another one at Highgrove. And after the one at Highgrove, which was last in 20... 20, no, 20, what does it say there? 2018 or 19 or something, 2020. Was it last, only last year, finally? We established after that, he encouraged everyone to get together and um, establish the Curlew Recovery Partnership England, which is around the steering group as a round table of these organizations. Um, but we're just the steering group, of which I'm chair. Um, and Russell Wynn is the, is the manager, but we're just the steering group. We then have a network that spreads out and we encourage everybody who is interested in curlews to join the Curly Recovery Partnership England. So please go to the website, curlyrecovery.org and um, sign up and get our newsletter, but also, and you'll get lots of email updates and so on, telling us what we're doing and how we're trying to save the curly throughout England. Recovery Partnership England. So these little 
little chaps are getting increasingly rare to find, increasingly rare. So I'll just very quickly, David, run through what the sorts of things we're doing. Up in the uplands where curlews have their heartland, the RSPB have been running a curlew trial management project, looking at a combination of habitat management and predator control, and then in some places and comparing it in places where there isn't any to see if there's a difference. We don't have those results yet, but they've had six sites throughout upland areas in the north looking at that. Um, curlews do very well on grouse moors and uh, because grouse moors are managed for ground nesting birds, which is what red grouse are, therefore other ground nesting birds do very well. But alongside that come all the issues, as I'm sure many people here are aware of, um, of the issues around upland management for grouse shooting. So the poor curlew finds itself right in the middle of a really bitter conflict of the uplands. In the lowlands, it's no less difficult to deal with, but the problems are a little different. Uh, the lowland meadows um, have lots of, as I say, lots of predation from things like foxes and badgers and so on. So uh, electric fences are really important to put round the nests so we can protect the eggs. Um, and there is actually a curlew nest in this intensively farmed landscape. And uh, so there's tractors, look, you can see silage, you can see crows, you can see trees, you can see all the things I don't like. But there's the nest in there, which has got uh, an electric fence around it to protect it. But though that pair in there produced four chicks, uh, so we, they were not we, they were protected, and this is Shropshire, by an electric fence that went around it. But as soon as the little chicks went, they got predated. So none survived that nest. So things are looking pretty serious. And in some places we have productivity which is almost zero year on year. They need to produce one chick every other year to maintain a stable population. Most are nowhere near that, nowhere near. Um, and so a crisis management is called head starting. And I don't know if you are familiar with the term, but head starting is a technique which has been tried with quite a few populations, whereby eggs are taken from the wild, uh, raised in captivity, and, um, and then when the chicks are ready to fledge, they're put back into the wild again. Um, head starting, these head started chicks were done in, in WWT, Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust in Slimbridge. And these eggs were taken from military airfields. Military airfields um, can, uh, are, do get licenses to destroy curlew nests actually because they don't particularly want curlews flying around with aircraft about. Uh, but as soon as um, WWT said that they would like the, the eggs, uh, they were massively helpful and supplied a lot of eggs for this head starting program. And so WWT, there they are collecting the eggs, um, taking them into captivity, raising them up and um, it was uh, absolutely joyous to see them. I went to see them when they were in their pens getting sort of a bit more used to being outside and a bit more grown up and then eventually um, these rather elegant juveniles were released and um, about I think there was 50, somebody will probably correct me from WWT, between 50 and 60 uh, were released of which uh, definitely a third have survived so far. And, um, and they were released into this nice wet area. This is another little film. Um, you won't be able to hear it, but you can, there, there's one, if you can see one of the curlews there and a couple in the background, trying their wings for the first time, um, getting out and then they just flew off and it was absolutely magical to see them. So, come on, next one. What I did at the end of 2020, as David mentioned in the introduction, is I set up a little charity called Curlew Action. And it's just dedicated to trying to help all these curlew groups that are doing fantastic things. So we do a lot of fundraising so we can develop, I'll, I'll tell you about the field workers toolkit um, and provide funds for people who need things like electric fences or whatever, and generally awareness raising because the more people that know about this, the more we'll all work together to save them. So in um, a couple of weeks time, in, in, eight, in April, I'll be walking 28 miles from the center of Bristol to the nearest curlew nest. 
So if anybody wants to sponsor me, I'm almost there. I've only got 150 quid to go for my target. So if anybody feels like it, you can go on Curlew Action website and push me over the line. Thank you very much. But that's all to raise funds on for World Curlew Day. So that's my little quick talk, spin through what's happening. There's lots of things happening for curlews. I didn't go into all the intricate detail about using drones to find nests and all the sort of techniques, the wonderful curlew groups that are working, most of which are volunteers doing it in their own time, um, trying to keep these birds from disappearing from the landscape while we try and put these major, major, major issues to right. I mean, curlews find them, that's why I find them so interesting. Not only are they beautiful, but I find them so interesting because they, they seem to focus the major conservation issues that we face today. Um, how do you deal with intensive agriculture and ground nesting birds? Uh, what do we do about <clears throat> afforestation? Everybody wants to plant trees, but is that necessarily the best thing to do? Uh, how do we deal with the high numbers of predators that there are in the UK? And, um, and, and what's the, mo the best ethical and the, the, the most moral way to deal with that? How do we balance these equations? What do we do about the management of the uplands? Oh, and climate change and curlew are highlighted as one of the birds that will be affected by climate change, pushing them further north. So they, this lovely, lovely, long-necked, long-billed, beautiful songster is right in the middle of the biggest conservation issues we face. So we have our work cut out to stop them disappearing. Um, but the more of us that know about it and care, the more we can turn things around. When you look at Braden Forest, you look at Worcestershire, some of these tiny, tiny populations, maybe five pairs, can we hold on to them? Can we actually hold on to them in these areas? And the answer is yes, we absolutely can. We know what to do, but will we do it? And it always comes down. It's not the birds. They'll, they'll breed if we allow them to. The tr trouble is, will we allow them to breed? Thanks, David. That's Thank me. you. Thank you very much, Mary. What an enigmatic bird. And it does feel very tragic as well. Do you want to go back and see if we can play those sounds? Um, yeah, so you like. when, you, when you share the screen, there should be a, a sign up talking about that. But yes, please, um, Zoomers, if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll, we'll come to them, especially at the, uh, the second part of the, uh, the evening when we look at the uh, Q&A. So how do you want me to do for that, um, David? Think, what do I, I do? I think Maya needs to come in at this stage. Oh, Sorry right, about this. This is live, live technical help here. Maya? Um, so uh, Maya, stop but, sharing. Hang on. I'll just get, shall I get to the right slide? Yeah, you can do that. Oh, yeah. It is lovely sound, isn't it? So it's worth listening to them. Definitely. Yeah, this is worth the wait, folks. So you, it is. It, yeah. Hang on. This Good is worth the admission fee on its own, this particular sound. There we go. So stop sharing. Yeah. Yeah. And then press share, share screen. But before you um, press the icon of your PowerPoint, there should be a little tick box on the left, bottom left, that says share sound. So here yeah. you are, a live oh, yeah. demonstration of uh, how to use Zoom. So it's not just That's about amazing. birds and conservation. It's about using Zoom as well. This will help you in your business life, guys. There we are. That was definitely worth the wait. Thank you very much for that help, Maya. And thank you very much, yeah, Mary, thanks, for uh, for playing that for us. A um, few questions, obviously, um, from the talk you've just given. 
Um, one thing is um, talking about upland management. Some of us here may not understand or know what the full extent of that is. Could you kind of give us a sort of a, a truncated um, response to what the, uh, the management is all about? I think it's 15% of our uplands are uh, dedicated to grouse shooting. And grouse shooting, um, red grouse are native birds to Britain, and they nest in heather moorland. And um, when grouse shooting became popular, as I mentioned, in the sort of 19th century and so on, um, the, the, the growing sport of grouse shooting needed more and more grouse. So the uplands started to be managed to really en enhance the number of heather moorlands that we could have and, and the, the, the number of grouse that nested in them. So grouse heather moorland management means two things. It means managing the heather by patch burning, as they call it. Um, so burning patches of the heather, which uh, then allows new growth to come up. So you get this mosaic of older heather and younger was burnt, but now beginning to grow again heather. So it's, it's that mosaic look that you often get on heather moorlands. And uh, the grouse and other ground nesting birds like that because they've got the longer heather to nest in and, and hide their nests, but they've got the shorter areas for feeding and walking their chicks through and so on. So the patch burning of heather is very good for grouse and other brown nesting birds, but it does come with quite a lot of controversy depending on how that burning is done. It can be done well and it can be done badly. If it's done badly, it's really bad. If it's done well, it's not so bad, but still has issues. It's not, I mean, it can be quite beneficial. Um, the other thing which probably gets everybody undoubtedly uh, hackles up is the amount of predator control that goes on in grouse moors. So intensive predator control, intensive management of foxes, crows, stoats, weasels, and illegally on some moors, undoubtedly birds of prey. So the hen harrier issue, which I'm sure many of you who are naturalists will know about, um, hen harriers in England in particular, down to you know tens of pairs of birds at the most, uh, badly persecuted because hen harriers have a real liking for red grass chicks. So. Upland moorland management finds itself in the middle of a lot of controversy. And, um, and in the lowlands, uh, we don't do grouse shooting in the lowlands, but there's pheasant shooting. And pheasant shooting comes with its own huge amounts of problems. Um, I learned a couple of days ago that just in Shropshire alone, 726,000 pheasants were released one year, every year into Shropshire for shooting. Now, only a proportion of those will actually be shot by the sports people. The rest are naturalized, uh, get caught by foxes and run over and so on and provide food. One of the reasons that people are speculating contributes to the high numbers of generalist predators we have, uh, all this sort of extra meat. I would stress that hasn't been shown by science yet, but it kind of feels like an obvious relationship. So that's sport shooting upland and lowland. Yeah, so, you know, the people that are totally against grouse shooting and want it banned, um, if, if, if say, it is banned, um, then a lot of those moorlands will not be managed anymore. So I presume that would have a detrimental effect on birds like the curlew and the golden plum and things like that. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, it would. Um, because at the moment, those upland managed estates are where Curly are doing all right. They're not doing brilliantly, but they're doing all right. Um, and so take those away suddenly, take that away. If you ban it, all of a sudden, um, talking to grouse moor owners, um, I'd say what I've asked them, what would you do if suddenly grouse moors were banned? A lot of them said, well, probably put sheep on it, um, probably um, forestry, wind farms, whatever, all of those which are detrimental to a lot of wildlife. So if we are going to ban grouse shooting, it needs to have a very well thought out exit plan um, of how we're going to maintain some of that habitat. Otherwise, what we simply do is is to abandon those birds to a, a country which at the moment is very hostile to a lot of wildlife in Britain. Our lowlands are not wildlife rich. And so if we're just relying on the lowlands for birds, well, I've, you've seen some of the figures that I told today. 
So it's a really complicated picture. It's full of controversy. It's full of people's emotions and histories and cultures and traditions all wrapped up in it. That's never an easy mix to deal with. And why it is the conservation of birds like curlews. Curlews are sort of the, the, the sort of standard bear for how are we gonna manage our landscapes into the future? Who has, who has a right to do what they want, where they want, whether that's in the lowlands or the uplands. It's fascinating and it's difficult. Yeah, I'm sure we can talk about this at length, and I'm, mm. I'm sure there'll be questions um, more detailed into that. The the curlew itself um, is is having a tough time, as we've discovered. It seems to be having a tougher time, to me, from what you've said and also from what I know, than other ground nesting, well, obviously the ground nesting, but other waders that or shore, shorebirds that share the same kind of habitat, such as golden plover and and perhaps lapwing. What is it about curlews? Are they just super sensitive? What, they what's are the deal? Really. I mean, lapwing are doing very badly too. I mean, waders are doing badly, full stop. Um, and I think lapwing are not far behind curlew. But lapwing are a little bit more adaptable than curlew. Curlew are just really annoying because they, they are very specific in what they like. And in some ways, they're quite specific. Nobody can quite work out why, if you create this lovely habitat, they just don't come into it. They just. They just don't. They are very sensitive to disturbance, very sensitive. Um, and, you know, lapwings, if you give them the right sort of conditions, they, they just go and nest. They're much more willing to sort of pitch in, if you like. Curlews are, are step back, keep out of the way, and they, they require things which I think we don't quite understand yet. Mm-hmm. And they also use whole landscape. So it's not just a matter of protect. And one of the things I didn't have time to talk about in the presentation, stuff that's been done by Rachel Taylor from the BTO in Wales, putting little GPS tags on curlews, showing just how much, even in the nesting season, they're using the landscape, flying kilometres all over the place to feed. Some birds fly three, four, up to 10 kilometres away from the nest at night, leaving one bird on the nest, but the other one 10 kilometres away to go and roost overnight. They need landscapes to live in and we're just a small packed country that has multi-use on our on our countryside and so we might get it right in a nesting site but if it's not right three kilometers away it may not be right for them at all so there's lots of factors to take into account yeah and there's other thing about curlews which i've kind of read about and thought about and that's the fact that is it possible that yeah, that they are actually kind of doomed anyway in terms of the evolutionary in the evolutionary sense because people seem to group them in the same category as cranes when you look at the numbers of species the different types of species like with the curly for example the eskimo curly is probably gone even though i wanted to re- i want to rediscover it that's another that's another talk the <laughs> slender bill curly is potentially gone um there's the uh, the uh, far eastern curly that's declining um, the bristle thigh curlew, which you know is not is touch and go, they all seem to be not doing so great as a as a family. Uh, do you think that um, they just haven't been able to adapt with the times in terms of what we've done with our land and how we use the lands? Oh, I mean, I'd hate to say that it's their fault. Uh, every single one of those species that you mention is not doing well because of us. So, I mean, we can, we, we can adapt, we can give them space, we can allow them some space if we want to. But if we, in, if we insist on getting the last little drop out of every tiny field, you know, that we, we will not give them that space. If, we ha- if we're cutting silage four times a year, they cannot nest. So we need those, those fields where they nest, we need to be a, find a way to say that field we will not cut. That field, we'll put fences around it. If we have to, we'll do some predator control, but we will have to protect that nest. And we know where they're very site faithful. They go back to the same place year on year. You could make a curly map of Britain and you know what little bits you have to protect in terms of their nests, and we can do that. So it doesn't have to be like this. It's kind of, I know what you mean, David. I mean, sometimes I feel so despondent about it, but then, you know, I see all these amazing groups really battling to save them. And we can do it. Farmers want them back. We want them back. So we can get them back if we want to. Okay. 
Yeah, we're getting a lot of questions in, so we'll, we can sort of run through um, those questions in the Q&A. Let me ask you another thing, head starting, um, which for some reason, which you may enlighten us on, is quite contentious, isn't it? Because when people talk about head starting the hen harriers, um, there's people up in arms about that. Whereas other places, I mean, I'll notice, for example, our good friend Dennis in the Zoom room talking about California, no, no, sorry, Joe Seal maybe, talking about the California condor, and that's that was head started. What is the opposition to, to head starting in, in this country, in Britain? Oh, that's a really complicated it's a really complicated question. I mean, head starting works really well when it works really well. So, for example, WWT have had a really great success with head starting spoonbill sandpipers, um, which were going extinct because of all sorts of reasons. And that's really worked and not controversial. Take the eggs, raise them up, put them back into the wild, educate, get the habitat right, and spoonbill sandpipers turn the corner. That's not controversial. They've had a fantastic success with Blacktail Godwits over in WWT as well. Those are really doing well. So it can be an amazing technique um, where it, the, the, the drawbacks to it are quite new, a few. One, massively expensive. Secondly, um, there's no point doing it, if, and it's immoral, I think, unethical to do it. If you just raise all these chicks, you take the eggs out of the wild, you raise all these chicks and you put them back into the wild and you haven't got the habitat right. So they get eaten, mown over, whatever, you know, they, and you're just feeding back into a, into a bad situation. You can't do that. That's not, that's an animal welfare issue. That's unethical. So we have to <clears throat> do, do head starting alongside everything else. The case of the hen harrier is all wrapped up, um, the opposition with the grouse shooting thing that we talked about earlier. So people who are against head starting uh, or brood management, as it's called with head starting, are saying we shouldn't do that um, because that's just a sop to, to the grouse industry and saying, you know, OK, you carry on killing them over there, but we'll take them away and release them here. Um, and the idea is that they don't like that because they're saying, you should just stop killing hen harriers and we're not going to ad adapt around you. So it's not the head starting as such, it's see that the political situation of hen harriers makes it unacceptable to some people. Okay. How, I mean, okay, we're all aware of the curly situation and, you know, there's all these organisations um, all working together to actually try and save them. But how do you get the average person walking down the street in a city in the UK to even care about what's yeah. going on. How many people would you stop in the street or could you stop in the street who would know what a curly was in the first place? Uh, such a great question, David. I mean, and that is, I, I honestly, I think that's the biggest problem, uh, which is why I started Curly Action, because um, we have to let people know that there's this wonderful wildlife out there and curlies don't, they shy and most of them don't live where most people live so if most people live sort of south and east if you like that's where there are no curlews so it's not surprising people don't know about them um so we have to tell people we have to we have to celebrate our native natural history we have to show them we have to have programs about them we have to teach it in schools we have to take people out and and, and show them safely how to look at these things um so that is a really great great uh, point you make and I think one of the reasons we could cover that when we talk about the GCSC and natural history um, we need to be a lot more nature literate we need to fall in love with the natural history of this country again and we need our kids and our young next generation to be fired up with the love of the natural world and that's all so curlies will benefit but so will everything else and I think once you know about them how could you not love them seriously so and they're big and they're beautiful and they sound great you just need to get people to know about them but it's a very good point. Okay, we uh, have arrived at that point actually in the evening where an hour has just nearly flown by right. so quickly. It's quicker than a curly's wing beat. Um, <laughs> let me ask you a question. Um, what is your favourite bird? Am I going to be surprised? Uh, <laughs> okay, if it wasn't a curly, if it wasn't a curly, probably a wandering albatross. Big difference. In so more ways than one. Yeah. 
well, big flappy things. But I mean, I just love their their remote majesty. And I think um, I remember seeing one once, uh, and it hung off the back of a boat. It was like a dinosaur. It was so big, and it, it just held the whole of the ocean in its eyes, really. And I was amazed by it, literally amazed by it. And I thought, well, if this a world can contain wandering albatrosses, it's a flipping wonderful place. Yeah, fantastic. And talking about the world and wonderful places, if you could be anywhere in this world right now, notwithstanding the current pandemic, where would you be? Orkney. Orkney. I'd go to Orkney and I'd go and... Orkney has is a hotspot for curlews. This time of year, they're all there. They'll be singing away. They'll be they'll be everywhere and just go and stand by one of those lovely locks in the middle of one of the islands and just let your soul be nourished that's where i'd like to be right now beautifully beautifully put mary fantastic um zoomers just to let you know what's coming up over the next week or so uh on monday the 29th of march we have a, a lady called mandy baker murray who uh, is an artist who illustrates feathers. She paints birds on feathers, so she'll be live doing a bit of that and talking about her art. Um, on Monday, sorry, Thursday, the 1st of, of April, it's not actually on the website yet, it will be shortly, but on that day we have Mary back again, this time talking about having a qualification in school for kids uh, in natural history and what chances are there of having that and what would it consist of if it did happen. So that would be an interesting and lively discussion. On Monday the 5th of April, we have one of Britain's uh, top bird photographers here. His name is David Tipling, and he'll be talking about bird photography. It's not a lesson, by the way, so don't come expecting, you know, how to use your shutters and all that sort of stuff and your notebook poised. It's all about just the, the thought and art of taking photographs and We'll be seeing some of his work as well. So that's coming up on In Conservation With. And thank you very much, guys, for supporting us all for this time. Uh, next year, we'll, next month even, will be our year birthday. So we'll have to do something special if it falls on the same day as uh, In Conservation With uh, broadcast. But Mary, um, thank you once again for being here and talking so passionately about uh, a species of bird which... I think everyone here will leave thinking more of um, in the future. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Dave. And Zoomers, uh, once again, it's great seeing you, great having you. Thanks for coming. Uh, take care of yourselves, as I always say, and don't forget to keep looking up. <laughs>